The Humane Society of Southern Arizona is holding a retro rescue vintage market this weekend at its new event center. Pretty cool the Friday and Saturday. This Friday and Saturday, neighbors can come meet the cooks and craftsmen setting up tables at this market. You might find some cool thrift stuff. And while you're listening to live music, you'll also learn more about HSSA's adoption specials to bring a new pet home. Yeah, organizers say please do not bring your own pets to this event because they'll have senior animals that are up for adoption walking around. Go, events go from 4 to 7 on Friday and then 10 to 4 on Saturday. And for more details or for VIP tickets, you can go to the Humane Society's website or Facebook page. Another opportunity to give uh, great animals a loving yeah, home. Yeah, that's really great. Love to see they're doing this. Coming up this morning, the Tucson Unified School District has an important meeting set for tonight. So we're going to look at which department's board members say will not lose part of their budget for the next year. Stay with us right here on Good Morning Tucson. Connecting communities through your stories that inspire us. It's Good Morning Tucson. Nurses and caretakers help thousands of people across Southern Arizona every day. Coming up on Good Morning Tucson, we meet a woman and her business in Marana helping veterans get to their appointments and live their regular lives. And Tucson Parks and Rec is holding an open house today so you can see what they have to offer. We'll take you inside the El Pueblo Activity Center. Good morning, Tucson. It's 530. I'm Claire Graham. And I'm Jose Sosaya. Yeah, we're starting this half hour looking at the University of Arizona's next step in solving its budget crisis. University President Robert Robbins says he is now taking a 10% pay cut to help the school's finances. Robbins has been making a base salary of about $816,000 a year, so the pay cut will cost him around eighty one grand. He says he also won't be collecting $150,000 a year for what the Board of Regents calls at-risk compensation or another $120,000 in performance bonuses. But Faculty Senate Chair Layla Hudson says the pay cuts feel like a symbolic gesture that don't go far enough. And what I'm actually more hopeful about is that the new leadership of the Arizona Board of Regents will begin to think twice about offering what they call at-risk salary supplements uh, to incentivize certain plans that the administration has that are not particularly well thought out. In our conversation with Hudson, she was referring there to Robin's support of the school buying a struggling online university, then rebranding it as University of Arizona Global Campus. Robin says he will consider laying off some more senior administrators. Hudson says, however, she's already seen the school let go of less senior leaders at university departments that do help the school make money. In a developing story this morning, if you have major medical debt, it could be going away. Governor Katie Hobbs is launching a new partnership to wipe away $2 billion of medical debt for families statewide. Arizona will now be using about $30 million of leftover COVID funding to negotiate with hospitals and debt collectors. And then the nonprofit RIP Medical Debt will buy out what's left. The group did something similar in New York City, clearing $2 billion of debt for half a million people. But the nonprofit's Jeff Smith says this deal in Arizona will go far beyond that. At least 750,000, perhaps more than a million, will soon be informed that their medical bills are gone. Their credit scores are on the way to improving. Their fear of getting the health care they need when they need it will be diminished. If you have medical debt, to qualify for this relief, your salary can be up to four times the federal poverty level, which would mean around $30,000 a year for a family of four, or your debt needs to be more than 5% of what you make. If you're eligible, you'll get a letter in the mail sometime in the next two years letting you know your debts are being paid off. I wanted to see just how many people in Arizona are dealing with medical debt, so I looked up the Credit Bureau's database, and this morning I found about 12% of people in Arizona have health care debt, owing around $700 on average. In Pima County, it's around 10% and $600. Cochise County is 10%, around $750. Going north, though, Maricopa County ranks fifth in the country for medical debt, with more than 15% of people owing an average of about $900. Heading to Marana, a local businesswoman is working to help our community with health care needs by going mobile. Tracy Raymond started Nurse Next Door in Marana, but she now works all over southern Arizona, from Nogales up to Picture Rocks. Her business helps with a range of health services. They can help you make doctor's appointments or just get you through daily life. They're also approved by the VA to help veterans. 
Raymond says the driving force that made her launch her business was the death of her husband. Yes, so while I was on a travel contract, my, um, my husband passed away. And he had really um, discussed with me how I wanted to help in the community and help people um, after the hospital and try and do what I can to keep them out of the hospital. For more information about the Nurse Next Door and how to connect with them, just go to our website, kega9.com. Danelle Veslick is our Miranda reporter, so if there's something you would like her to check out, you can scan that QR code on your screen or send her an email. 534 happening today. TUSD's board is meeting again and trying to set their general budget for next school year. Up to this point, board members haven't been able to agree on which departments will have to deal with cuts. But last time they met, members did say some teams will see their budgets lowered by 5%. Some, like board member Sadie Shaw, argue that slashing the budget will affect not just regional superintendents, but it also may mean losing at least 50 teachers' assistants. Worth noting, though, the board clarified that some school departments will not have their budgets cut. The departments that are exempt from that 5% cut are exceptional education, fine arts, interscholastics, uh, school safety, and transportation. Now, a key vote in tonight's meeting will be whether or not to set more money aside to help custodians and monitors on campus. We'll be following the discussion at the board meeting and sharing updates tonight and tomorrow morning right here on KGON 9. Now, you can follow the latest decisions from TUSD's board and other big stories in our neighborhoods by going to our 9 News Navigator. Click the Navigator button. It's on KGON9.com. That's going to take you to this map with each story pinned to where it's happening. When you click the pin, you'll find what you're looking for. And now, K-Gun 9 first warning weather. Let's go to April now for a check on our forecast. Not too bad out there to start the day. Yeah, not bad. It's going to get a little chillier, but uh, gorgeous view from Mount Bigelow this morning. You can see kind of in the distance over the city lights, clear skies, a little breezy on the higher elevations. Not too bad, though, at the surface. We're at 48 actually at the Tucson Airport. Certainly going to be cooler uh, across Mount Bigelow, but we will see numbers drop before they go up. There is even a chance we may hit the low 40s in that 7 o'clock hour, depending on uh, cloud cover and or wind. Otherwise, this will be one of the warmer days of the week. Part cloudy skies still going to hit about 75 in Tucson and probably right at about 70 uh, in that three o'clock time frame for you in Sierra Vista before it starts to go back down. So we are going to see a couple of warmer days, but then we've got our next chance for rain. Yeah, we're going to be talking about when that's going to happen. In fact, some of those chances have gone up, so we'll take a look at that. And again, your neighborhood forecast in Tumamoc. April, thank you. New on Good Morning Tucson, if your power bill has been feeling higher than normal recently, you're not alone. Bree Pacelli joins us in the studio this morning to explain why so many people seem to be literally feeling the heat. Hey, Bree. Yeah, good morning, guys. We've had a number of people reach out to the newsroom about significant increases in their electric bills. So I wanted to reach out to TEP and find out what might be the cause. I spoke to Joseph Barrio, spokesperson for Tucson Electric Power, and he says a customer's bill should only significantly increase if their usage increases. Barrio says some customers have seen a significant increase in bills the past couple of months for a couple of different reasons. First, he says over the holidays, people tend to use more energy with family in town. Also, in January, we experienced colder temperatures, which means people turned on their heat. But he also says part is the TEP rate increase. Our rates did change back in September, so there's an adjustment there. Uh, but if anything, we want customers to know that they should only be paying for the energy that they use. TEP says that rate change raised the average bill by about 11 more dollars a month. With summer coming up, that means ACs are going on and higher bills. But TEP says you can reach out to their customer care with any concerns about your bill, and they can help you find a plan that fits your needs. I'll have all the information linked on our website, kega9.com. Back to you guys. All right, Bree, thank you. Of course, the electric bills aren't the only ones going up right now. We've also heard from several people who say their Southwest gas bills are going up too. Heather Enos says in years past, her gas bill has been around 30 bucks in the winter. This year, she says it's gotten as high as 200. I replaced my unit uh, in spring of 2022 with a more efficient unit. And even with that, it's like I said, it's, it's around about eh, $38. Southwest Gas has raised rates by 7% in the last year. We reached out to the company and they say some of the best ways you can save on your gas bill is to put in weather stripping around your doors and windows so the heat doesn't creep out and replace your air filters.
Almost 539 on the south side today. Tucson Parks and Rec wants to showcase all the things people can try at the El Pueblo Activity Center. Parks and Rec is hosting a series of open houses across town so families can sample what many of the centers have to offer. Rec coordinator Izzy Galindo says when it comes to El Pueblo, people love to use the basketball courts and one more space that lets people exercise any time of year. The walking track, it's an indoor walking track, it's hot. You know, on the south side of Tucson, some things are not very nice on this side of town, so it's better to be walking indoors, in the AC, than outside. So today's open house goes from 10 to 2. The first 100 people who come will have their name added to a raffle. The grand prize is winning a free universal membership that lets you use all of Tucson Parks and Rec's activity centers. And Raina Preciado has been following this as our Southside reporter. If you have a story you want her to look into, you can always scan the QR code right there on your screen or send her a quick email. Always got to find a nice place to feel like you can uh, go work out all that stress. Clearly. Yeah, I mean, it's great to have a community center like yes. that. More stories next. We're dusting off the old film reels to look at the absolutely Arizona history behind old Tucson. Coming up, how the studio is honoring one of its founders for helping the movie industry flourish here in Tucson. Why don't we show you this live look from our Tumamak Hill Skycam. There is a walker with their flashlight shining bright among the city lights. Well, April will tell us how it's going to feel if you're going out for a walk after the break. It's 540. You're watching Good Morning Tucson. More updates for you this morning at 542. The Supreme Court is putting a temporary stop on the controversial law in Texas that lets police arrest anyone who they think has come into the country illegally. The law was supposed to take effect this coming Sunday, but this pause will go through Wednesday of next week so the court can have more time to look over it. Last week, a federal judge in Texas also blocked the state from implementing this new law. This morning, the U.S. Supreme Court is also clearing the way for former President Trump to appear on the ballot in the presidential and primary elections. The justices unanimously decided he should be on the ballot in Colorado, where the state Supreme Court ruled the opposite. They're voting today in Super Tuesday, along with 15 other states. Most of the Supreme Court also agreed their decision applies everywhere, meaning no other states can take Trump off the ballot. A handful had been suing because of a line in the Constitution that said you can't run for office if you've taken part in an insurrection. This morning, three people are suing both Alaska Airlines and Boeing for a billion dollars. All three were passengers on the 737 MAX 9 plane that had its door ripped off in the air this January. A recent FAA audit alleges that Boeing failed to comply with the safety and inspection standards they should have in building this plane. The company now has fewer than 90 days to show the government they have a plan to improve their quality control. And now, K-Gun 9 first warning weather. Almost 544, April Madison joining us, enjoying this view, of course, from Tumamak Hill. Uh, I'm sorry, April, we couldn't bring back the guy with the flashlight, <laughs> but it is a nice time, I'd say, to go enjoy a walk out there. The one the solo person that I went know. through, yeah. Uh, I, usually there's quite a few. It kind of depends on the day, but uh, even at these uh, dark, chilly hours of the morning, we usually see quite a few flashlights going through there. Uh, of course, not ever when I'm calling for it, but <laughs> you can see a little bit of light there in the distance, which tells me the clear skies and the calmer winds means that that 48 probably is going to drop down before it starts to go up. So if you are planning Tumamak or anywhere else, just make sure you got the extra layers. It is going to be warmer in the afternoon, though. Today and tomorrow will both be uh, the two warmest days of the week. Already pretty chilly, though, in Cochise County, uh, about 10 degrees cooler than where we are in Benson, right at 40 in Tombstone, 38 for Sierra Vista and Bisbee, and then the greater uh, metro area also seeing 48 at the airport, but low to mid 40s. Vail, Corona Day, Tucson, uh, out near Green Valley as well. Today, really not much change other other than a few passing clouds kind of moving up and over that ridge. You can see it right there. So we'll see anywhere from mostly sunny to partly cloudy skies. Uh, but this isn't really packing a whole lot of moisture. This is the system that will eventually dig down and bring us some changes. So today we'll call it 75, low 70s for most of Cochise County. Maybe shaving off a few degrees tomorrow with in cl uh, increasing clouds and increasing wind. So not really temperature wise much change, but we will see some breezy uh, conditions along with those increasing clouds ahead of what will eventually bring us that chance for rain as this starts digging down. We've been talking about the Sierra Nevadas and more snow on the way for them. A state of emergency for many of those states. This should start moving into central and northern Arizona by early Thursday morning and then the tail end of it going to swing through just barely the southeast section of the state. Two impulses, one on Thursday, another one on Friday. Not a great chance for rain, maybe a 30 to 40% chance uh, and then 20 by Friday. So uh, combined 
we're still only talking about probably about a tenth of an inch or slightly above for uh, overall totals, maybe a few inches above 6,500 feet when it comes to snow. We'll definitely drop temperatures down, though, more than 10 degrees between Wednesday and Thursday. Not going to see much change on Friday, but then you get into the weekend and there it is. We warm back up uh, and we dry out. So back to the mid 70s for Tucson and mid 60s and low 70s in Sierra Vista. Not too long on that rain right yeah. there. Gonna enjoy this weather. By the way, if you don't already appreciate our desert landscape as a beautiful <laughs> backdrop for films, 85 years ago, Columbia Pictures saw that same dream. They built a set west of the Tucson Mountains to film the movie Arizona. Now, old Tucson has now become a big part of movie history, but a forgotten part of that history includes the set's own mayor. Pat Paris has a look at what makes him absolutely Arizona. Really, Nixie Hall is the reason why we have old Tucson Studios. Tucson historian David Layton is giving credit where credit is due. Nixie Hall is the reason old Tucson exists. Yes, plenty of credit still needs to go to the late Bob Shelton, who turned old Tucson into the Wild West theme park. But there would be no old Tucson if it weren't for Nixie Hall. According to Layton's research, Hall came to Tucson in 1934 as part of a group that bought the Santa Rita Hotel in downtown. He began enticing Hollywood studios to come film westerns in Tucson and have the crews and actors stay at his hotel. He was a one-man chamber of commerce, they would call him in the newspaper. Because of Hall, several films were shot around Tucson in the 1930s. Then in 1939, he made another trip to Hollywood to talk to Columbia Pictures. He convinced them that they need to film the movie Arizona based on Clarence Buddington Keelan's book Arizona. Uh, here in Tucson to make it authentic. Finally, they say, okay, this is a good idea. And of course, you know, they're going to stay at his hotel, the Santa Rita Hotel. Right. So he benefits that way. Columbia Pictures then used local labor to construct the movie town of Tucson circa 1861. Some of the adobe buildings still stand today. Nick Hall was ever present during that construction. The cast and crew was so appreciative of his work, they actually voted him uh, the mayor of Old Tucson. Uh, Nixie Hall is the only mayor I know ever elected in Old Tucson. Once filming was done and the mid-November 1940 premiere approached, the Tucson Junior Chamber of Commerce came up with an idea. They worked with two local banks and they created what was known as Old Tucson Script or Old Tucson Money. Now the design is actually based on money that was actually produced in Tubac, Arizona in the 1850s and 1860s. The old Tucson script came in multiple denominations with various scenes from the movie Arizona on the back and had to be spent at local merchants by November 19th of 1940. All this in anticipation of the major motion picture filmed at Old Tucson, only made possible by the mayor of Old Tucson, Nick C. Hall. little piece of history you never would have known. And yeah. it's great to see just uh, the legacy so many years removed that Nixie yeah. Hall has is just like, oh, there's still living testaments to all this. Uh, yeah. Who knows, old Tucson uh, trying to revitalize, of course, as a space to be part of the movie industry yeah. as well. There you go. All right, still to come this morning, the craft beer industry is struggling. We're checking in in brewers, with brewers in our neighborhood to see how they're trying to stand out in a crowded marketplace. So stay with us here on Good Morning Tucson. Five fifty four happening now. Local breweries say they're trying to stay afloat in the struggling craft beer industry. King and I's Jacqueline Aguilar is sharing how the team at Borderlands is cutting back on canning and shipping while giving customers a better experience when they come in for a drink. While it seems like a bitter brew for the craft beer industry, breweries like Borderlands are doing everything they can to overcome these challenges. The craft beer scene is a competitive market. Ayla Kapahi, head brewer at Borderlands Brewing Company, says more options are what consumers want. If beer drinkers have less products to choose from, they're going to be more selective on where they spend their money. We're definitely noticing that um, craft beer drinkers are drinking more than just craft beer. They're interested in non-alcoholic brews, um, seltzers, cocktails. Data from the Brewers Association shows that there was no growth in the market in 2022 and it declined 2% in the first half of 2023. Chief economist at the BA, Bart Watson, tells me rising costs and distribution expenses are part of the financial hardships. So we're often seeing breweries pull back on distribution 
Um, you know, breweries are seeing the input costs, the raw material costs have gone up a lot in recent years. And that goes beyond some of the things you might think about, you know, things like CO2 have, have skyrocketed in expense. Which is something that Borderlands has already done. A lot of that has come from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, with the increased tariff prices on stainless steel and aluminum cans, that's created some barriers for us to widely distribute. So we're really focusing on serving in our tap room. Despite these challenges, Watson says this is normal to see with a maturing market. You know what we're seeing for a lot of local breweries, tap rooms and brew pubs now looks much more like what you'd expect out of say the restaurant market. New people can still open if they're doing something different, if they stand out, if they give people a reason to come. But openings and closings are going to be roughly in balance. Kapahi says the Tucson craft beer community is working to revitalize the passion for the brew, like introducing Southern Arizona inspired flavors and hosting events like last weekend's beer crawl. Although we're seeing a struggle within the industry, the Brewers Association wants to reassure everybody that craft beer isn't going anywhere. They encourage Tucsonans to continue supporting their local breweries to keep the doors open. Reporting from downtown on Broadway and Tool, Jacqueline Aguilar, Kega 9. We do have another hour of everything you need to know to start your day coming up. Keep it here for Good Morning Tucson at 6. It's a historic initiative from the governor's office. Coming up on Good Morning Tucson, how a new partnership could wipe away medical debt for as many as a million people across Arizona. And the U of A's top leader is taking a pay cut as the school digs itself out of this budget crisis. Why faculty members say they want more cuts at the top straight ahead. And right now, Arizona firefighters are helping crews in Texas battle their historic wildfires. Why one firefighter from Cochise County is calling this the biggest challenge in his career so far. Good morning, Tucson at 6 starts now. Connecting communities through your stories that inspire us. It's Good Morning Tucson. Good morning to you, Tucson. It's Tuesday, March 5th. I'm Jose Sosaya. And I'm Claire Graham. We begin this morning with a closer look at the new historic plan from Governor Katie Hobbs to buy back $2 billion in medical debt from people across Arizona. On Monday, Hobbs shared that the state will partner with RIP Medical Debt. Arizona's plan is to use around $30 million of leftover COVID relief funding. The state will negotiate with hospitals and debt collectors, and then RIP Medical Debt will buy out the remaining balance. In this new partnership, the group Group's Jeff Smith says Arizona's plan is the first of its kind and it could help as many as a million people in our state. At least 750,000, perhaps more than a million, will soon be informed that their medical bills are gone, their credit scores are on the way to improving, their fear of getting the health care they need when they need it will be. So if you have medical debt, to qualify for this relief, your salary can be up to four times the federal poverty level, or your debt needs to be more than 5% of what you make. If you're eligible, you'll get a letter in the mail sometime in the next two years, letting you know your debts are being paid off. And a developing story happening today. The man accused of shooting and killing a University of Arizona professor is coming back in front of a judge for a pretrial conference. Shortly after Professor Thomas Meixner was killed in October of 2022, police arrested former grad student Murad Dervish. Dervish still faces first degree murder and other felony charges. His trial is still scheduled to start in May. On the north side, this morning, Tucson police want your help finding a man who they say played a role in a deadly shooting. Officers say Saturday, this person and 40-year-old James Alvarado assaulted three other men near Oracle and Prince. TPD says at one point, Alvarado threatened to shoot at the group, so they ran away. But one of the men who was attacked shot and killed Alvarado. Officers say the second attacker ran away. If you have any information that could help police, give them a call at 88-CRIME. Staying on the north side this morning, Pima County prosecutors say they are dropping the charges against a man who crashed into another man and a baby crossing the street last week, killing the infant. Sheriff's deputies say 34-year-old Marquise Reese and an 11-month-old were walking across Ruth Roth and Kane when 32-year-old Colton Ortiz drove into them. Deputies originally arrested Ortiz for manslaughter and a DUI, but in a statement, prosecutor, prosecutors told us, quote, new evidence has come to light that required these charges to be immediately dismissed. Further investigation is now underway based on the newly discovered evidence. At this point, though, they say they can't explain what that evidence is, so we'll keep you posted when we find out.
We do have a good news update for you this morning. Tucson police have been looking for a missing man, Dallas Star. They now say that he has been found safe and he is back with his family. This morning, Tucson police are saying a final goodbye to a retired police dog, K-9 Oni, who has died. Oni joined the K-9 unit in 2018 and got certified to work on patrol and in narcotics detection. During his time with police, the German Shepherd went to more than 700 crime scenes. He caught almost 300 criminals and made 10 drug busts. The police department says he was also good for a laugh, like the time he cleared out a home, went back into the kitchen, and walked out with a burrito in his mouth. K-9 Oni retired in the last year. Approaching 6.04 this morning, we're continuing our coverage on the moves to solve the University of Arizona's ongoing financial crisis. Part of that may now mean cutting the salaries of some of the school's top officers. Our Bree Pacelli is in studio this morning, and Bree, we're learning that the school's president is going to have his pay cut. Yeah, good morning, Jose. Four months ago, we first learned about this multi-million dollar budget deficit. Now, University President Robert Robbins says his salary will be part of the plan to cut costs on campus. Here's a breakdown of the changes on your screen. Robin's base pay has been $816,000 a year. Taking a 10% cut will cost him just over $81,000. He's also not going to collect an added $150,000 a year. It's from a type of pay the Board of Regents calls at-risk compensation. And on top of that, Robbins will not collect another $120,000 in performance pay. That money is typically paid over several years. All this is just from Robin's pay, but this week we learned he also plans on cutting costs in central administration and reviewing if it's worth keeping some school vice presidents. The school also says it will not offer retirement incentives and open jobs may stay empty for a while. Robin's claims there will be no across the board layoffs, but the school may let some workers go on go as soon as next month. Arizona faculty Senate member Ted Downing says he would like to see more changes at the top. You got a whole stable full of associates and assistants and God knows what vice presidents, all of them up at the 200, 300, quarter of a million plus salary. How many horses do you need if you don't have the right jockey? Downing also argues the school would have saved money if it did not grant so many scholarships to out-of-state students. We'll, be follow we'll, keep, we'll keep following updates and sharing them right here. Reporting in studio, Brie Pacelli, KGUN 9. And now, K-Gun 9 First Warning Weather. Let's check in with April Madison to get you out the door this morning. A little bit of a chilly start out there, but it's going to warm up. Uh, it is. Today, tomorrow, going to be probably the two nicest days, temperature-wise, anyway, to be outside, especially today because it won't be uh, with as much wind. In fact, you can see how calm it is there in Oro Valley, the view from El Conquistador there, and you can see just enough light that we're seeing mostly clear skies to start the day, which means temperatures probably get a drop. We're at 47 now at the airport, a lot of 30s, though, uh, and close to freezing even in Wilcox morning across Cochise County. 75 is what we should hit in Tucson today with low to mid 70s to our south and east. Cochise County, you'll see even some 70s as well. Right at it for Tombstone, Sierra Vista, Hereford at 72 and about the same in Douglas. We're still tracking that next chance for rain. It has gone up just a little bit. We'll take a look at that. Also, highs will once again drop back down. We'll take a look at your seven day forecast coming up. We'll be watching to get ready, April. Thank you. News around the nation at 6.06. This morning, families in California are bracing for even more blizzard conditions. The Sierra Nevadas saw more than 10 feet of snow fall on them. Ski slopes north of Lake Tahoe got more than 8 feet in the last few days. And it's not just California feeling it. Parts of Oregon and Washington also dealt with intense winter storms Monday. Troopers even had to shut down more than 100 miles of interstate between Nevada and California to keep drivers off those packed, dangerous surfaces. By Thursday, parts of Northern California and Southern Oregon could get up to two feet of snow. Firefighters from across Arizona are in Texas this morning fighting the wildfires that have now burned through more than a million acres in the Panhandle. Fire Captain Travis Adcock works for the Department of Forestry and Fire Management in Cochise County, but he and his team of two other firefighters from Douglas and Elfrida have been in Texas for a week now. The smokehouse fire they're fighting has grown to the biggest in state history. Adcock says it's easily the biggest fire he's ever faced. This is absolutely huge. To me, it looks like, you know, it's overwhelming because that's a lot of acres. Over a million acres is, and then like three or four different fires, you know, that engages everybody that can fight fire. Adcock says his crew is set to stay in Texas for one more week before they can come home. 
Happening today, voters in more than a dozen states across the country are picking their party's primary candidate on Super Tuesday. We want to show you a map of all 15 locations that are having primaries today. They're highlighted in green. In Alaska, only registered Republicans are going to vote. American Samoa is also opening its polls for their primary. When it comes to Arizona's elections through 2024, several candidates for federal and state offices are starting to send in their paperwork so their names are on the ballot. Monday was the first day candidates could turn in voter signatures so their names could eventually be picked like they are being in these offices one day. Democratic Senate hopeful Ruben Gallego says he turned in more than double the signatures he needed to get on the ballot. Republican candidates Carrie Lake and Mark Lamb have not confirmed their exact numbers yet, but the expectation is they have enough signatures to make the ballot too. Incumbent Senator Kirsten Cinema has yet to file the paperwork to start collecting signatures. On the south side, if you're looking for a job, there are two hiring fairs going on today and tomorrow at the Kino Event Center. Today from 9 to noon, the company Access Recruiting Solutions will be looking to hire stock work clerks, uh, phone operators, and several other kinds of jobs. Then tomorrow afternoon, Pima County is holding a lifeguard recruiting event from 1 to 4, looking for lifeguards and swimming instructors to work at our local pools. Again, both job fairs are at the Kino Event Center. Still to come this morning, we are delving into Arizona's water crisis. We're asking leaders from Tucson Water what their team's role will be in conserving the gallons of this resource that are sent in from the Central Arizona Project. And let's grab a live look this morning from our Tumamox Skycam. Look at that beautiful sunrise just starting to wake us up. It's almost 610 and you're watching Good Morning Tucson. So stick around for your full forecast. Welcome back at 612. We're looking closely at how our neighborhoods are feeling the pressure of Arizona's limited water supply. Right now, though, Tucson Water says it is committed to making sure our community has a high quality supply for the future. This past fall, the city implemented the One Water 2100 plan, which treats all of our water sources, stormwater, groundwater, surface water, and recycled water as one body. It's an important step because cities and states across the Southwest rely so heavily on the, Col the, the Colorado River through the Central Arizona Project. The director of Tucson on water, John Kamik says the One Water Plan aims to keep that sustainability going. We always pump a form of groundwater, but but the important part is it's replenished, it's renewed, and that's what the Colorado River uh, gives this community by coming through the CAP Canal. So we bank the water into the aquifer, taking Colorado River water and essentially turning it into groundwater. For reference, Tucson receives 44 billion gallons of water each year from the Colorado River. You can watch our full special report, Running Dry Arizona's Groundwater Crisis. We're diving into how our state supports millions of people and even large farms with water access. You can watch it on Kagan9.com and it is streaming on all of our platforms.